Hello everybody, good uh, afternoon from uh, Luxembourg. So I hope that uh, you and uh, yours are all safe and uh, as uh, risk managers always do, you try to learn from these very interesting times. So uh, I was very proud uh, when uh, Stefan, Stefan Martin, so a former colleague of ArcelorMittal asked me to moderate your sessions, David. Uh, and in this role, my first duty, and it's uh, a real pleasure, it's to introduce you. But in fact, uh, who in our risk management world does not know David Vos? Huh? So at least if you don't know the person, you have heard about his books or his blog or the famous model risk software or as a minimum, you have heard about uh, his legendary criticism of our famous risk heat maps or risk matrix. <laughs> so just one friendly advice, guys, if you use risk matrix, do like a shameful alcoholic, don't tell him. <laughs> In, tw <laughs> in 2011, uh, I had the pleasure to spend uh, three days of training in our offices in Luxembourg with David and 20 colleagues of uh, ArcelorMittal dealing with risk management uh, to learn uh, a little bit more about risk quantification and create some awareness about the tools. And I can tell you that uh, beyond his expertise in risk modeling, David is a very nice guest to invite and to discuss with, including after work hours. He's also very tolerant uh, the proof is that he's still accepting after 10 years to speak with me despite my horrible French accent. Uh, for your information, I'm living in the deep south of Belgium and David lives in the north. So it's also another link, but also a difference between us. So now just uh, would like to, re to tell you some rules about the questions uh, for this session. We hope that you will have a lot of questions. Your questions are very important. Uh, please use the chat box during the presentation. I will monitor this the chat box uh, continuously. And because David has some uh, chapter in the presentation, at the end of each chapter, I will evaluate if we ask uh, uh, David to answer immediately. Otherwise, we will group everything, all the questions at the end of the presentation, and we will open, also open, you can open at, this, at the end of the presentation your microphone to ask a, a verbal question. I would say. So David is a very knowledgeable person in the domain of quantitative risk analysis, also very passionate about it. So I'm sure that uh, those who listen to him for the first time will be convinced. Uh, no, I have enough spoken. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we cannot see your presentation. No, I'm just sharing now. Okay. Ça marche? Ça marche. Bien. <laughs> On commence. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Um, um, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm going to talk about quantifying risk and how it can be used in decision making. So um, I think Patrick already warned you, so uh, I'll, um, I'll start with that. Um, so uh, I, I've been a quantitative risk analyst for something like 30 years, and it's fairly relatively recently that I'm, in the last four or five years, that I've got involved in risk management. So the, the roles of the risk managers in the corporation. And uh, I saw this bizarre, strange difference. And it goes something like this. There are, um, on the left hand side, we have the people, the risk managers with their GRC systems of governance, risk and compliance system. And these people have got the title risk manager. Right? And so there they have, there's their heat, their heat map. And they, their basic um, overview of the risks of a business are that you have these risks, um, which we try and move from the red, which is a scary high impact, high probability. And we, in the black, uh, 
uh, star, and we try and move them down to the position of the white star, where um, it's all in green and everybody's happy. And then they they add up how many green, orange, and red risks we've got. Meanwhile, in the other side of the world, so the everybody else in the business, well, what are they doing? Well, the business development people are doing spreadsheet risk analysis models to figure out what to do. Health and safety are doing their um, checklists. You've got operations people are doing bow tie analysis with probabilities. Project people are doing cost and schedule risk analysis. Strategy people are doing um, decision trees, engineers are doing failure mode analysis, and treasury are doing those whole fancy quant models. So it's this huge variety of different types of risks, risk analyses that are generally done in any large business, and they are. And this is the world that I've been used to. Um, so I'm just kind of becoming used to the, the world on the left-hand side. Now, so what happens? Well, risk managers say, because they like their qualitative heat maps and they say our organization, and I promise you this is true, they say our organization is not yet mature enough to go quantitative. And I think, really? Um, have you had a chat with them? Because <laughs> there are an awful lot of people doing an awful lot of quantitative analysis. And they kind of they say these people, well, those are specialists. Meanwhile, the other people are doing all their analysis saying management doesn't really listen to us. And this seems to me like a, a very silly situation. So um, let me just step back to what the beginning of the purpose of enterprise risk management should be. I know enterprise risk management is something of a, a, a strange phrase these days because it means different things to different people. But if you go to the basic principles of it, we're at the to start off, any enterprise, whether it's a government agency or a business or whatever, it has its goals and it has its values. So, and we have these risks which will impinge on those goals and values. Um, the first risks that you, you have are to do with your values. So we want to ensure that the people who work for us and the public in general, they are not harmed by our actions, by our products, whatever. So you've got health and safety. You also we're becoming more and more aware that we should be trying to take care of the environment. We're custodians of the environment, and that should be part, integral part of our set of values as a corporation if we're going to be a, a, a valued member of society as an entity. Right. Well, beyond that, we also probably are trying to go out there and make some money. So with, when we make money, we're either trying to preserve or create additional value. And I think if you follow the ISO 31,000, that's pretty much says what, what we should be doing in, in summary. So we will have our strategies for how we're going to develop our business in order to um, gain more money or preserve it. And of course, those strategies are directly impinged by a number of different risks. We might not have the money to execute our strategies. We also might not have the reputation, etc., that will allow us to expand in the way that we want. We won't be able to find strategic partners or whatever. A part of our strategies is we're going to be making investment decisions. So we're going to have to build new factories, um, develop new products, get rid of old products, etc. So, and those, those are the key drivers between, um, in, in terms of our, um, the monetary contributions to our strategies. But those investment decisions, well, they, investments, they require that you have a rollout process for a, a project to develop a new product, to build a new facility, et cetera. And that, also, of course, can um, include some uncertainty or, or about how long it's going to take. When would it be completed? Will it be done in time? Will it be done before our competitors get to the market, for example? The vaccine for COVID-19 will be an excellent example. Who's going to get there first? So the, the schedule, how quickly we're going to achieve something, that, that the uncertainty and that time drives um, some of the investment decisions. At the same time, um, the finances, you know, the, the evaluations, um, how much is going to cost, how much are we going to gain out of it, these, these also contribute to whether we make the investment decisions. And of course, the, the longer it takes us to complete, say, the um, a develop a new product, um, the less money we'll make out of it. Because if we invest the money up front and it takes us a long time to complete, then the net present value um, reduces because it's longer before we get the cash flow in. So these things are all interconnected. 
And then over the top, we've got uncertainty. So we don't just have risk, risk being these ideas of something bad that might happen. You can also say something good, you know, a probability of it happening. And if it does, here is the magnitude of the impact or impacts. Right, but we've also got uncertainty. Um, how much is it going to cost? Um, how long is it going to take? Uh, uh, how many sales are we going to make, etc. And in the end, what we, if we look at the goals and values that we have, then we are looking for the treatments of those risks that will enable us to maximize the, the possibility of achieving our goals and, and also are, um, staying within our, our set of values. And I kind of see that this is what enterprise risk management should be. And it's rather a long way away from that heat map. So um, we, uh, first of all, I want to look at uh, a richer way of describing risks beyond that heat map idea. Let's start there. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, a typical sort of stylized um, uh, risk register. We have a risk ID, we have uh, some description, we have a, a sort of a score for the probability, a score for the impact, and then we have a, an, an aggregated severity score. So, and, and the, the more red it is, the, the worse, et cetera. And what typically happens there uh, when I see these risk registers is you have rather a vague description about a particular risk. Like a risk will happen the, because of cause one um, that will end up in a health and safety um, catastrophe or whatever. Um, and I just want to illustrate this, this idea that you can have like two causes, you can see on the left-hand side here, you've got two causes. Um, with four different impacts. And they would, in a traditional sort of risk register, they're, they're typically eight lines. And you absolutely cannot see the big picture here. But if you were to look at it from a bow tie point of view, then you would see a much clearer picture. On the left-hand side, we have these two causes, which can cause the same risk event. And as a result, you've got these four different types of consequence. So bow tie, you read from left to right, it's kind of a story. This thing here, course number one, could end up producing this risk event, the point of which we, we lost control. And as a result, we had these different consequences, which may happen. And they can be different magnitudes and da da da. Now, wouldn't it be marvelous to be able to pull this all together in one kind of evaluation? And that is essential in order to be able to do enterprise risk management. Well, if you expand this idea of a, uh, a bow tie, then you can see you have in the center, this risk event. On the left-hand side, you have all of these different drivers. On the right-hand side, you have these different consequences. Um, and in between, we've got on the left-hand side here, we've got controls. And on the right-hand side, we've got mitigation. So the left-hand side, these are things, actions we may take or may not take in order to try to prevent that risk event ever happening. So for example, a fire in the head office, maybe one reason we could have a fire in the head, in the head office is that somebody discards a cigarette. Well, um, how can we stop that from ever happening? Well, we could have, for example, um, a no smoking policy, which of course almost everybody has these days. We could also have a quit smoking program so when people aren't sort of surreptitiously smoking the loose. Um, we could also have um, non-flammable materials and carpets, etc. And if we had all of those, then we could help prevent that risk event, um, which is the fire, from ever happening. But if that fire, and there are, sorry, there are many different ways in which a fire could happen. You could have a lightning strike or electrical fault, um, and a deliberate ar arson attempt, etc. Um, and so we have different controls that we would implement in order to try and stop the, these from becoming the risk. But given that we've got the risk um, event occurs, what else can we do? We can have uh, fire alarms that will get and, and get people out of the, the building quickly. We can have um, foam spray um, systems, etc. Things that will minimize the damage and minimize the, 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 any other type of loss, so we, um, whether that be financial or with human health or whatever. All right, with this, this is a much richer way of describing risk, and it has lots of benefits. Um, first of all, it lays out your logic, and you can say, well, we've decided we haven't implemented a quit smoking program here, that's in gray, for example, because there's no point because nobody's smoking, because we've enforced this, um, this thing, and it seems to be working fine. Um, we can have things in green, that would be that this is working well, we're getting it, checking it regularly. Maybe in orange, well, it's, it seems to be working, but nobody's checked it. 
hasn't been checked recently, or maybe it was checked and it's out of out of um, specification. So we can have a sort of one visual representation of how we're managing risk. In a, if you like, you can think of this as a dashboard on its own. I think it's great for communication and for brainstorming. I think it's great for um, operationalizing the treatment of risks because you can assign these very specific individual controls. You can assign them to people. You can say this person is in charge of that particular activity. And that means that you actually are managing, actively managing the risks. And it turns out that this is very simple maths to analyze, um, that you need to analyze it. Uh, and, and finally, you can optimize. So you can choose, all right, um, we, maybe we could get rid of some of these controls. Because once you understand the total impacts uh, that you're protecting against, you might find that you're really spending excessive amounts of money on, in some areas because the, it's, not, um, it's not really suitable for the amount of risk that that, that particular uh, driver is creating. I'm not saying these numbers have to be very perfect, but we, de we definitely have a much greater feel than if we have a, a qualitative system. Um, we can also talk about the interrelationships between risks. So uh, one risk certainly can drive another. Now, you might have thought, for example, COVID-19, if we'd gone back a year or so ago, we, were, we would have said that there was a small probability of a, of a pandemic that would have created worldwide chaos. People would have put big impact, tiny probability. That's a risk. And that if that risk occurs, well, goodness me, then there are an awful lot of others, and we're now living that, an awful lot of other risks that will occur as a, as a result. And it cascades. You know, companies uh, go bankrupt. That means you've got fewer suppliers, da 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 and it goes on and on and on. Right, so with a bow tie kind of approach, you can also map how one risk is connecting to the next one, the next one, the next one. And that becomes really interesting because now we understand things like, here's a control, which is apparently not currently working. But that the value of that control is beyond the value of simply this risk, uh, the consequences from risk number one, because that risk number one, that is a driver for risk number two and risk number three. So the, the ability for this control to prevent that first risk, you have to, you have to measure its uh, value uh, against the cost, if you like, um, against all the protection it provides, not just from risk number one, but two and three. So you have to add probabilistically, add it all up together. So that's the end of my so, first section. David, yes. yes. So we have uh, one question, but you have also a very good supporter with Hans. Uh, so we're ah, answering Hans. already. <laughs> yeah. So the, the question was from Giselle, uh, who asked uh, about the percentage of the industries using bow tie approach versus or over the heat map approach. Oh. So, uh, yeah, so it's a good Hans. question. I would say um, 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 the bow tie approach is used a great deal in um, health and safety, um, but in a qualitative way. So just a mapping out, and that's already a, a great benefit. And there's um, uh, CGE, something like that, a company like CG, which has produced a bow tie tool that's been around for a long time. Um, so you see a lot of that. It's a qualitative tool, so it, it's really you could do it in Visio if you like. Um, you know, just drag and drop gra um, graph graphical elements together. But it, it's that's used a lot. In it, this in itself, it's not. This is not a a replacement for a heat map because um, well, we'll see that as as I my talk progresses, we'll see that that's not sufficient. But it's one tool that I want to um, make people aware of. And there'll be a few other tools as we go along. Um, and then, thank you, David. We had another remark or question from Axel. Uh, if you don't want to take it, I can I can uh, take it. So he's uh, uh, acknowledging or, or this uh, or stating that more often the more he work with companies on risk the more he's finding out that uh, uh, there is never clear values no defined goals uh, so this, this sort of things the strategic the strategy even yes. is sometimes missing so i, I agree that's, yes um, yeah. so but actually you, you're you're in a very good position to answer that um, if you want yeah. to yeah, I can because 
uh, of course, we can take that uh, offline after, but it's actually true that if we want to uh, implement or make the risk management process or all the risk management activities more robust, more integrated, a lot of other things need to exist in the company. If the only thing that will work is only risk management, in fact, it will not work. It's true that objective must be clear, clearly defined, monitor uh, with KPIs, and then naturally all the risk system will connect to this and uh, be integrated but uh, it's true that uh, yeah I, I I agree with you Patrick and um, I, I feel um, uh, that one of the big barriers is that people people think that if you want to go into some, some more quantitative approach to to risk management that you need to have everything in place um, so we, we've had clients I have a client who who is who was trying to do their um, risk appetite matrix and they they wanted to get their risk appetite matrix in place before and it took them nearly a year and they they in fact the guy just left <laughs> <It's>, he never <laughs> achieved it uh, yeah. but it was it was a waste of time uh, you you, you, you uh, there's another question that I'll, I'll come to a bit later about um financial valuations but um when when you uh when you start implementing um, proper enterprise risk management quantity, well, I would call it proper, um, questions arise, and they will, but you start to understand why those questions are there, and you start to see the context to it and the value of it, and you pay attention to the, the ones that are important. So it, I, I, I don't say that, I, I say the opposite. I, I, I say that it's not necessary. everything must be in place in order for you to start going down an approach like this. You build it up. But uh, the gaps will become apparent, and they will become they will be important or not important. So, so let's keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I'll just go back to that slide. So, getting quantitative, I'm going to describe four four simple distributions that you should you should consider. Um, uh, if you're on LinkedIn, um, then uh, there's a couple of articles you might like. One um, more about. Um, or a probability distributions, every risk analyst should know. Um, and sometimes you should know them so you don't use them. Um, that was, I think, my most um, uh, successful article uh, ever. Um, it's not Kim Kardashian level, but, you know, 15 or nearly 15,000 people viewed it. Um, it's, I guess, empirically, it must be worth reading. Um, also, if you're going to use any probability stuff, then I really recommend that you you read this article. Um, it's an old article, wrote it um, six years ago, but it will very quickly give you um, some rules about how not to manipulate probability distributions because that's where people generally make mistakes. They're very simple rules. Once you, you, once you see them, you go, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's very simple to follow. So um, let's look at the, the four distributions. The first distribution I, I want people to understand is uh, called the Bernoulli. This is named after Jacob Bernoulli. There's a picture of him in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. You can probably tell by the clothing that this was invented quite some time ago. Um, we're not talking new stuff here. Uh, so it was in the 1700s uh, um, Jacob Bernoulli invented the, the Bernoulli distribution. Uh, what does it do? It's so simple. Um, it's almost you wonder why somebody got to get... <laughs> their name on attached to it. But it's basically that there are two, two different possibilities. Something happens, let's give it a probability one. Sorry, let's give it a number one if it happens. And something def doesn't happen, let's give it a zero. So if like you're counting how many times it can happen, where it can only happen once. Right, so it's either the value can either be a zero here or a one. And there's a probability of it being a one. So the probability of success, if you're probability of the event occurring. That's kind of it, really. The Bernoulli distribution, you, if you were to use a Monte Carlo simulation, it's just going to be randomly generating either a zero or a one, zero, one, zero, one, like that. And the frequency with which it produces a, um, a one, a relative frequency, is, is a probability. But we can do actually a lot of cool things with this already. So if you were to type, but whoops, excuse me, if you type Bernoulli 0 0.2, times 10, that would model a risk that has a 20% chance of occurring. And if it does, it's going to cost you 10 units. All right, easy. Here, uh, if, uh, if some variable is bigger than two, then there's a risk with an 80% chance of happening. Otherwise, it's zero. So maybe it's, uh, if you had more than two employees um, left the company in the year, then you've got a risk of something. 
Otherwise, you don't. Um, then there's another one here, Bernoulli, if some variable is equal to one, then P otherwise Q. So if a competitor comes in, so a competitor, one is a competitor comes in, that could be another Bernoulli variable from somewhere else. Then the probability is P, otherwise the probability is Q. So you, yeah, you get the idea. You can, in quite simple terms, build up an, um, an interesting model with dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. All right, the second one, and you will notice that um, this is um, named after Simeon Poisson. Um, so a Poisson distribution. Uh, you can see that this is old as well. This was taken before um, color paintings were invented. It was all still in black and white then. All right, so you've got Simeon Poisson. Uh, what is this? This is how many events might occur when there can be more than one. So uh, a lightning strike, it's not like if a lightning strike happens, well, we're done. It's happened, it can't happen again. No, it can happen again and again. All right, so this is a, a, a random variable that you are counting that can have, happen several times. Uh, an accident, a strike, or whatever. So it only takes one parameter, which we give the, the label gamma, um, oh, sorry, lambda. Um, um, and this is that one parameter is the average number of events that are expected to occur over a certain period, right? It's really easy to use. So mu, if you could say mu was the number of events per year and you had t years, then lambda is just mu times t, because we're talking average. If on average there were three strikes a year, how many would there be over the next five years? Three times five is 15, a Poisson, 15. There, you're done. It's so easy. Um, if you had mu events per year and there was a probability uh, that, that P, that the event causes a consequence of, uh, that you're interested in. So um, how many consequences would you have? Well, same idea. If you've got, um, um, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say three strikes a year and there was um, a 20% chance that it would shut your factory down. How many factory shuts down, downs would you have in a year? It was three times 20%, 0.6, it's plus on 0.6 and you're done. A um, little pointer that sometimes we're interested in um, um, the probability of no events happening. That's just e to the minus lambda, x to the minus lambda, or the probability at least one happens, which is one minus e to the minus lambda. And that's really interesting already because, like, for example, imagine something, um, a lightning is striking some particular building, and it's striking three times a year on average. Um, uh, and the strike might end up blowing the building apart. Well, if you had say, three strikes, 20% chance of uh, the strike actually breaking the building, that's three times 0.2, it's 0.6. But once it's broken, it can't break again. So we're only interested in, in the probability of it not being zero. So it's one minus e to the minus 0.6. That's the probability in the next year you're going to lose that building from, from airstrike, from lightning strike. Okay. Right, um, the next two distributions are so simple that they don't have a name attached to them. They're just basically drawing graphs. Um, the f this one, uh, three-point estimate. That's all we're saying is, I don't know how much this thing is going to be, how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take, how big the market size will be, but I'm going to put in a minimum, most likely, and a maximum value. And, and the easiest way of drawing that is with a little triangle distribution. You can see why it's called a triangle distribution. It takes a minimum value, most likely value, a maximum, and you just draw it the lines in between. A slightly more advanced, only slightly. A PERT 249, whereas this was a triangle 249, you can see that it's a bit curvier, and that tends to more, more reasonably reflect what people think. Um, but a better estimate of all of them with something called a three-point estimate. Um, this is the same kind of curve as this one. But instead of asking for the maximum, if you ever ask somebody for a maximum, it's a very difficult value to give. Minimum, yeah. Most likely, yeah. But maximum, no because we can always think of a scenario where it would be bigger and bigger and bigger, and you end up sort of in some tortuous uh, conversation. So instead, if you ask, well, uh, nine times out of 10, what's the biggest it's going to be nine times out of 10? Well, that's P90, if you like, and that's a much easier uh, a value to, to elicit from, from somebody. All right, so three-point estimate. Um, if you happen to use our software, model risk software, then the, uh, Patrick was very kind enough to mention then that would be one of the distributions in our software. I kind of invented it. Um, and the last one, and we're really done with probability distributions, is a discrete. And the discrete distribution is simply, instead of saying the very variable is continuous, it's discrete, it means that uh, how many bridges might I have to build? How many servers might I have to build? 
Um, it can be zero, one, two, three, four, or it could be zero, half, one, one and a half, two. It doesn't have to be specific un unit values. We just have a list of values, and then we have a list of probabilities associated with those values. And, and you're done. And with those four, you can model an enormous number of different things. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Do you want to carry on, uh, Patrick, or should I pause for a Yes, minute? no question for the moment. Everybody okay. is lost it's, with the they, they just IT lost and all these things. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's look at some financial risk. Um, so uh, the, the first classical one here is the list of risks to estimate capital reserve. Um, how much money do I need to set aside? Well, I've got this whole portfolio of my risk register, all these different risks. And I've, um, so what people typically do is they take the probability of each risk they, and they take their best guess at how much it will cost and they add, multiply the two together and add them up. So the formula on the left hand side here. But this is a disaster because it gives you just a, that middle point. Effectively, you're saying like, for example, I've got a, a one in a one in a hundred chance of losing a million dollars. So multiply the two together, that's 10,000. I'll put $10,000 aside to cover my million dollar risk. Well, that has literally no chance of being useful at all. So, you know, you've achieved nothing really. Right, so instead what we can do, a really simple um, risk analysis model. Just got to load up here, I'm hoping. In practice, it's worked terribly well. Wait a sec. Uh, where are you? Still there, still there. there. Here we are. <laughs> it's just hidden by my PowerPoint slide. All right. Um, it's because we've got this um, um, conference sharing thing over the top. All right. So look, what we got here, we've got a risk, an ID. Everybody does this. Everybody has a description. Here we're just making it a little bit more interesting. We got, is this risk repeatable or not? Is it a Poisson or is it a Bernoulli? If it's a if repeatable, it's a Poisson, it's Bernoulli, it's not. And this already is an enormous advance from heat maps, which always assume that risk can only occur once. But that's obviously not true. And then we've got the probability or equivalently the frequency, depending on whether this is repeatable risk. So if it's a frequency, then um, th these values can be bigger than one. If it's a probability, they can't. Right. We've got min mode P90, so th three estimates. And then if we, if we wanted to, we could just simply do the sum product of these two, and we end up with a number 156 and go, great, 156, that's how much we need to set aside. But if we want to model this, which we can easily do, like here I've got, if this is a repeatable, then it's Poisson, otherwise it's a Bernoulli. Right, so let's have a look at what that looks like. Um, for example, I could look at this one. If I just click on here, go view function, you should be able to see, oh, you can't. Behind the scenes, ah, it's a shame you can't see that. It's because of this um, this um, um, conferencing thing. It's not allowing mm -hmm. me to mm -hmm. pop it up. Uh, let me just see if I can. No, I can't show it to you. Ah, it's a shame. Oh, no, I can. I'm being stupid. So I just didn't click the right thing. Ah, ah. My fault. Yeah. All right, my apologies. We'll cut that and we'll edit that out. <laughs> so um, you've got to, so here we've got uh, a Poisson frequency, eight. Uh, on, on average or is eight. And you can see there's a distribution around that eight. So what, what happens is that this model is that if, I, if I hit the F9 key, it just randomly generate different possible scenarios. Now, if you had, let's say you had nine, nine of these events occur and you've got a minimum, most likely maximum value, if you like, or P90. So we've got nine times this thing might happen. On average, nine times 10, 90, if you like. So we've seen something around there. But the first time it could happen, it could be really small value. And the second time it happened, it could be really large and et cetera, et cetera, all those nine times. So we had kind of had to have a, a way of adding them all up. Well, you can do it in different ways. And if you use at risk, there's a, an aggregate, um, a compound function, I think. If you use other tools, you can just do um, um, little loop summations, et cetera. Um, if you're using uh, the model risk software, then you would have here, you've got nine events. Here is a distribution of an, uh, of an individual event. And then what it's doing is nine times it's taking random samples from here, adding them together, that's one number, and it's repeated until we get a nice sort of histogram. So this is a visual representation of what that would look like. Um, and if it was uh, a Bernoulli, then it would just be zero or one, exactly the same process. And of course, we, at the end, we sum them all up. We got here, and then we just, uh, we run a simulation. You know, 
and it takes a few seconds. So here we go, the simulation, um, thousand samples. So David, I yes. think it's important already to say that the result of uh, uh, quantitative risk analysis is not really a number, it's more a shape, in fact. It's a very, it's a, it's a very so, nice uh, because um, remark. People, it's sometimes difficult to communicate that to the management. Huh? So because to, to report about a number, you need to get from them a level of a degree of confidence or something like that. Huh? So yeah, it's true. Um, you know, but if you ask any manager, um, how old will you be? What, what date will you die? You know, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> well, give, just give me a date. Give me, you know, I want a number. Give me the, <laughs> I can't give you a number. Exactly. You know, so yeah, there's a, there are, we know that there's a range around things. So what we're sort of, and we inherently, we intuitively know that. We're just not very sure how to describe it, really. And, you know, if you go to any sort of modern business school, they, they do teach these things, but uh, perhaps uh, they, they don't teach them very well. I don't know. Um, it, but it, it kind of gets lost in the. I, I don't. I, I, a, a, a good question is well, how do we make the management better understand this? Um, what, what I personally do um, uh, is I recommend a two hour, two hour training course. I've done many of them where I just with the executive, um, so nobody else there, um, I show them what results look like. Uh, and they test themselves to see if they understand it. And, you know, and they can, I'm external. I, they can ask all the dumb questions that they want. And I'll, I promise you that after two hours, and that includes things like, how do you know it's a nonsense model, you know, garbage in, garbage out and so on. After two hours, they get pretty comfortable with it. It's, and it's an extraordinary uh, idea that you hear a lot that people say, ah, you know, um, our executives, they just don't have time to, to, um, to learn about probability stuff. Two hours. <laughs> they have the time. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> yeah. They just they have a good teacher. <laughs> if you have a good teacher, that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here's the difference. You got 156 is your base estimate, and of course that's sitting down somewhere low here. Um, but now we've got 246 would be like the P95. Um, or if you don't like the P95, you pick the P90 or some you know some other number. So you, you pick a number here and go well, and you can of course, bring it down to number. If you have $228,000 um, in reserve, then you've got enough to cover this risk with like 89, 90% chance of, of success. So that's pretty good. All right, so that's the first kind of model, um, a, the first kind of decision that one has to make, very common type of decision. Um, another one is to decide what kind of uh, investment to make. And I see, uh, I see, perhaps a bit less these days, but I've seen a lot of decision trees um, being put up and oh, people should use decision trees. And I'm really not a big fan of decision trees at all. And that's some reasons. This is a typical um, decision tree. Uh, you've got, uh, it's a classic one that you will see in Ewan Dorp's book and stuff on, on decision theory. Um, you're, you're basically deciding whether or not um, you're going to drill a particular oil reserve. And um, you, uh, you, you decide whether you're going to test it beforehand or not. And if you test, then you don't know what the result is going to be, because otherwise, why would you test? Um, but then you have a more informed decision about whether or not you're going to drill. So how, these sort of decision trees look like this. You have um, a first uh, a square, which is your initial decision, and then some random stuff will happen. And then afterwards, you, uh, as a result of that, you'll make another decision. But that second decision, you kind of know what that will be. That second decision is, or based on what what I will then know at the time. Um, so that is not a decision really that we're modeling. It, in fact, it's a, it's a random variable that was based on some logic. Like if we would know this, I would go and do that thing. Otherwise, if I would know something else, I would go and do that other thing. It would be a decision that is driven by, um, by randomness. Uh, and what, what I particularly don't like is this um, the, the way that we have to essentially reduce all the information we have in, into a, a very crude type of analysis. So here we've got like a three prong, prong fork of what the result might look like. And you can see here, you, you know, this is re replicated as three lines, which are trying to, trying to uh, reflect a, a whole probability distribution. And you can see that if you put effort in, you sort of know some of these 
distributions well and others less well, then um, th this is you're, you're reducing all that information um, and almost uh, to an absurd degree. It also kind of assumes that there's only one, it's a, it's a very simple analysis that would allow us to, to figure out the value of the decision. What reality is that we're doing any investments is we've normally got a great big cash flow model where it's got MPV analysis and all that sort of stuff with um, uh, um, lines of uh, revenue streams and tax uh, um, ratios and all, that, all, all, all sorts of things like that. So uh, here's a real simple kind of model that re reflects the idea of um, how are we going to try and make uh, one of several different um, possible decisions. And all you do is you run a model um, several times where you put in the different decision options that you would have gone for. So in this case, um, there's two. There's the baseline decision, which is we spend our baseline amount of money and it will give us a base um, access to the market. But we could also spend another two and a half million odd um, and that will give us access to a 90% larger market. Which should we do? Is, it, is that 19% worth it for the 2.4 million? Let's go find out. You can use exactly the same model. One that we do now is going to run a simulation. Um, and this time, it look, looks a little different. Here, it's running a simulation, the first one, it's one of two. Now it's going to run a second simulation. It's doing the same thing, but twice. So what's happening is that um, you've got first model is being run with those first parameters and the second model with second parameters. And then we're asking ourselves, well, which is better? And what you can see here, if you've got um, two different uh, two different options, the base and the extra investment. And at every probability, cumulative probability, if you read off along here, so we'll just drag that down, we'll drag it down. So just pick, say, somewhere around 60%. If, at that probability, you will see that you're getting more net present value, so more, um, more benefit using the extra investment than you are using the base investment. So at that probability, and at basically any other probability, it's definitely a good idea to go with the extra investment. So this is, in technical terms, this is called first order stochastic dominant. It means that that curve is always to the right of the other curve. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more complex than that. They overlap a bit, but there are rules for being able to determine that pretty easily. So any sort of logical person would say, actually, from this perspective, this is a better investment decision. It's kind of nice because you can also look at all sorts of things like um, market growth um, as being the largest uncertain parameter and it's part of the decision. Well, can we, this is, we're unsure about this. Can we nail it down a bit? Can we go out and do a market study so we can find out it, the value of that a little bit more precisely? That would help us narrow down the uncertainty and therefore be more sure about one investment or the other. Okay. So, um, very simple models. Um, and I promise you that both of those models only use the four distributions I was talking about. Nothing, nothing beyond that. And yet, in general, you can say that those are enough to be able to do any risk assessment. I want to quickly look at cyber risk. Um, cyber risk is one, one of the other areas of enterprise risk management that one has to consider. It's, um, it's of course, it's a hot topic, um, particularly with COVID-19 and all the, you know, all of our shutdowns and conferences like this and the meetings, etc. But um, there is a, there's been an initiative from the Open Group um, some time ago to, to create a quantitative approach to, um, to cyber risk, and it's called FAIR, F-A-I-R. You can go and look it up. It's quite an interesting idea. It actually, it turns out to be very simple. So it, it's, it reads from left to right as, um, or you can make it read from left to right as a kind of a story you've got here, you've got people attacking and then you're comparing their ability to attack with your ability to repel. If, if their ability to attack exceeds your ability to repel, then the risk happens with a certain frequency. And then after that, you get these different uh, losses. So you, your loss could be a primary loss, immediate loss of money, some secondary losses as well that come maybe down the, the line. And that's exactly equivalent to a bow tie analysis. And it's, it's very surprising to me that people don't immediately realize that. So this frequency here and this number is the same as the contact frequency and probability action that is coupling there. Then you've got, if you're familiar with this, um, there is a rather abstract capability, which is looking at the threat capability and the resistance strength. And it says, oh, here are distributions of the two. If one exceeds the other, you're in trouble. 
So what is that probability of one big and the other? It's kind of working out the area between the, between the two curves you can see there. That's a bit too abstract from my point of view because we're talking about very abstract concepts of my, my strength and or my vulnerability and your strengths and well, I'm not sure what they entirely mean. And then you've got the losses, which is exactly the same idea. A, an absolute, a much better way of looking at um, uh, cybersecurity risk is to just extend that, extend that bow tie analysis a little bit better. So you start including your controls and your mitigations, and I've already described what they are. So, and, and you can have standard templates, say this is how we're going to control against this particular risk or set of risks um, for a server, for a particular um, database or whatever it is, right? So you can have some consistency in the way people are looking at things and you can include more than just monetary um, impacts. I mean, when you think about it, we don't really want um, to reduce, say, uh, oh, 10,000 customers were, um, got all of their personal details um, um, given out to the internet. Uh, it's more than just a pure monetary value of that. Uh, we might get some insurance, and, but our re reputation is shot and um, the, we will have to change our whole system to try and make sure that um, it's more secure and this can cause delays and there could be many, many impacts from that. Not purely just something you want to call financial. And there could be also other risks that can occur as a result of down here. All right. Um, and then I just want to quickly look at project risk. So in project risk, um, you, so if you're, again, if you're on LinkedIn, you can look at this common mistakes in project risk analysis. This is a, um, a pretty recent article I wrote. Uh, I, I, you can go take a look at that. All these things are free, of course. Um, as a, a rather longer project risk analysis webinar um, that I recorded, you can also find that on LinkedIn. And that will give you uh, whole ideas about the techniques of, of risk analysis, luckily, so I don't have to, to talk too much about them now. But the, in, in project risk analysis, we use it, those exact same distributions. In fact, we only use three of them, really, to describe risk. I have to try and figure out how to get that file open. OK, so here is a, a typical project. You can see a schedule here, um, like that. You've got a schedule. Um, and we, we take the schedule and we just add some, um, some uncertainty and some risk. So, for example, um, you're unsure about the amount, total amount of work that's there. Maybe you're being a bit optimistic and there's quite a lot of uncertainty or et cetera, et cetera. And you can put some un descriptions of uncertainty and there's an implication of what that means in, in terms of spread plus or minus percentages. You can add some risks in here out of a risk register. So, um, and all, all of the risk, this is the software from my company, but all of the project risk analysis software look the same, basically. So pick the one that you, you like the best. They all, if they're good, they all use the same basic um, uh, risk analysis ideas. You, and you have the, maybe some don't include expected frequency, so repeatable events, but basically you've got the same, um, same kind of thinking. And this means that when you, um, you, you run a simulation, so there was a few hundred tasks, um, run 10,000 samples on this, and you, you end up with looking at your results. So how long until a project is finished and you see the weekends, or you've got gaps in the weekends, um, how much does it cost? Um, so distribution of the total cost of the, I'll just make that 50, distribution of the total cost. And of course, um, they're also, the, these things are connected together. So I can just quickly look at this without the trend line. So you can see that you here you've got a correlation. So the finished state and the cost, there is a relationship because some of the resources we have takes longer, costs more, obviously. Right, so you can take this information and um, with, depending on your software tools, you can take that aggregate sort of uncertainty and then put that into your project risk analysis or your um, your cash flow model. So you can talk about the effect of uncertainty and um, in, in time of completion of the project and effect of um, maybe the capital investment that's gone into the project as well. You can, you can link all these things together. And I think that then we're really starting to talk about, um, uh, you think we've got investments, we've got a bow tie of a cyber risk, etc. If, if we could pull all these things together, wouldn't we be then dealing with um, enterprise risk management? 
And that's what I think you can do. Well, first of all, you have to go and um, do that. So, uh, <laughs> right. And so uh, in with the new. Now, how is it possible, remotely possible, that we can put these things together? Um, well, we can. And the, there is, um, it's not, it's really not rocket science at all. Um, I, I, I find it very interesting. I've met lots of risk managers who are absolutely dead set on their heat map. They love their, um, sometimes it's four colors, oh, it's green and then yellow, orange, red. So, you know, maybe a bit more sophisticated, but they're trying to figure out how to add a few greens and a couple of yellows and see what's that make? Is it still an orange or is it are we in yellow ground or what do you do? There are even guidelines that tell you, um, and again, it's not an article I, I've put up here, but in, you can find it on LinkedIn. Um, Semi-quantitative risk analysis and other absurdities, I think it's called. Is a, you can see it, it's a picture of a guy with a, an umbrella and a huge stone above his head. Anyway, in there, I point out one of the guidelines that says, oh, well, you can, um, you can add the indices together, or you can take the average, you can take the uh, maximum, or do whatever else you like. It literally said that. So basically, there is no method, certainly, and there can't be, for aggregating um, scale. So we have to go to some quantitative method. All right. And the so quantitative... Dave, yes. David, just one yes. thing. We are coming close to the, the and end. I'm so, very close yeah. to the finish myself. But thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we, what can we do? Well, there's, there's this theory called multi-attribute utility theory. And if you, you can go read about it. Um, if you don't want the, to go and look at the academic world, you can go and read an article that I wrote and this actually lets you put in the information and then so you can go through this process and from a, take the data from what would traditionally be a heat map and actually create your own aggregation tool um, in pure Excel. So, you know, might give that a go. Um, the math is not, not astonishingly complicated at all. But ba the basic principle is that if you take an entity, you have an entity structure like this. This is our Pelican Enterprise Risk Management Software, but um, you take the, the the entity and it's all of its sub-entities, like ArcelorMittal Global, and then ArcelorMittal Luxembourg, ArcelorMittal London, whatever, Brazil, and you know, all these different entities. And I'm trying to sell the software now to Patrick. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then you take the sub-sub-entities and you go down to the department level, whatever. You, If you take one any one entity, then you that entity will have some sort of financial scale associated with it. Um, you know, you're a, a small business for, might have a loss of a million dollars could be catastrophic, but for a much larger business, it's not catastrophic at all. You know, with a corporate entity, it'd be barely worth mentioning. Um, but there are other things. So you can have for a financial scale, you can have very different scales. But for something like health and safety or environmental, we might say, well, look, if we manage to wipe a species off the planet, um, whether that's done by a little, um, a little small bit part of our whole business or whether it's done by a, a very big part of a business, we still value that as a pretty dreadful thing to have a, achieved. Um, so we want to have that consistency of, of our values and health and safety and, and environment and other things, that can, and reputation is a, a good one. But we also want some flexibility on financial scaling. So what is catastrophic for me is not catastrophic for the next one in financial terms. And we can do that. And this will tell you exactly how to do that. And it's called based on multi-attribute utility theory. This means that in the end, you can take all of these concepts I've been talking about and you can pull them together and add them. You can, you can aggregate. And the only way you can do enterprise risk management is by aggregation. If you remember that first slide I had, we have the risks um, on one end and then you had the, um, your goals and your, your values at the other end. In order to be able to have a strategy, you must be able to understand where the importance, relative importance of these different risks are, right? And so what can you do? Well, um, for example, you can start like, maybe you've got a strategy, one of our main strategies, EBITDA, we want to achieve 3.2 billion. Woof. Uh, well, uh, apparently there's a 5% chance that you, that's not, um, that's going to that's gonna fail. Why? Because you've got these different tactics. These tactics are dependent on, for example, this tactic is established presence in the EMEA that depends on having sufficient liquidity. And if we have any big financial risk that will hit us, so anything more than say 10 million, we're hit, we will not have the money to achieve it. So financial is a big impact. We look at that and we can see which one of these risks is most impacting, relatively speaking. 
And that brings us down. We can say this risk here is really a problem to us. How are we going to fix that? Because we are not going to achieve our strategy. I think this, achieving that, we start to realize that we're uh, the actual goal of talking to executives in terms that they really care about and they don't really care about heat maps. And we can also still look at individual risks. Um, you know, that, that, that doesn't go away, except that we can now look at all sorts of different risks. And if we use a multi entry utility theory, we can look at them all together in, in this one domain, which is very nice. If you really want to, you can turn this into a heat map too. Um, and there's nothing to stop you, but it's, I'm not against the heat map per se. I'm against the idea of assigning numbers to these things and thinking that adding reds, and counting how many reds you got, that's risk management. That's my, my fundamental problem with it. And um, I think this is my very last slide, but now imagine that you can sum up your risks. You can ask yourself questions like, well, where, where, are, where are risks concentrated? I, mean, I don't care if it's health and safety, reputation or whatever. Um, well, in this case, the, of all of the businesses, uh, several streets for some reason, um, is the area, the bigger the area, the bigger the aggregate risk. This is the one that's really um, causing us the biggest problems and you know, work your way down through the other entities. Um, well, barrier ownership, if you've got uh, controls and mitigations, many of them will not be controlled by you. They're suppliers, they're, um, they're contractors, they're um, consultants or lawyers that you use, um, 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 industry representative firms, um, even government agencies. They, they have some contribution to your whole um, risk management. It would be very nice to know how much are we dependent on whom? So in this case, you know, we're dependent quite a lot on this external consultancy firm. Maybe we don't want to be that dependent. When you aggregate, when you have the ability to add risks together, you now have the ability to look at, split it up in different ways and, and understand the concentrations. We still get the financial loss distribution. That's all kind of, that gets, gets there. And we can get little, um, you know, dashboard dials says, right, most of our stuff is financial, but there's still a big environmental that's as important almost as the financial risk and strategic, et cetera. And I think I'm done. I think my voice is done too. So I hope I didn't go over time too much. Okay, so Mayer, can you tell us? Yeah, I think we are, uh, we, we passed the, the due time, gentlemen. So I think it's time to, uh, unfortunately it's time to, uh, it's time to close now because the, the next session will start in, um, in 15 minutes. And if we need, if people need a bit of a break. And we'll so, be, uh... Yeah, I have saved the, the chat box because there are good remarks from uh, from Hans. Uh, so uh, it was not really a question, he was more answering or giving clarity to the participant about uh, some topics that you have explained. Uh, David. Mm. So. Well, Hans is a very knowledgeable man, so thank you, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I think we can uh, okay. thank you, uh, both of you, David and Patrick. Uh, very uh, insightful. Uh, presentation, the fact that we are running out of time and still have questions to deal with. <laughs> I think it's a good, uh, <laughs> it's a good signal. Um, I think we might need to think about the session, version two of this session, maybe next year at uh, Riskin, but in a, hopefully in a presential session and um, where we can uh, have nice to see faces. finish the discussion around a coffee or something. <laughs> Well, I do okay. appreciate the opportunity to, to, to be able to present. Um, thank you ever so much, Patrick, for joining us. It was very nice to see you again. It's been a long time. I hope it won't be as long before I see you again. But, uh, <laughs> David, you should have a look to the, the chat. There's a lot of very nice messages for you and Patrick as well. Oh, thank you. A lot you. of uh, very happy people. Just have a look. I'll leave it open for a moment. All right. Thank thank you, I'll see if I can figure out how to look at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Also, bye. Pleasure. Thank you, my.